Hi, my name is Julie. Hi, I'm Mackenzie, and we're doing chapter 51 on animal behavior. Okay, so what is behavior? Behavior is everything an animal does and how it does it, and this includes muscular activities like breathing, chasing prey, yawning, and non-muscular activities like chemical secretion to attract mates. And there are two questions to ask when asking how does animal behavior happen or why is proximate and ultimate question. The proximate questions are the how and they deal with the mechanisms underlying the behavioral act, and the ultimate questions are the why questions, which address the evolutionary significance of the behavior. Um, three famous ecologists are Nico Timbergen, Carl von Frisch, and Conrad Lorenz, and we're going to be talking about a bunch of their experiments later on, and ethology is the scientific study of how animals behave, and particularly in their natural environments. Um, these two questions were asked by Tim Timbergen, um, the first two are approximate questions, and they deal with the mechanisms, and the second two are ultimate questions, and they deal with evolution. Fixed action patterns, they are a sequence of unlearned behavioral acts that are essentially unchangeable and once initiated are usually carried out to completion, and they can't happen without a sign stimulus, which is the external sen sensory stimulus. For example, the three spine stickleback fish, whenever they see something with a red underbelly, they attack it, even if it's a fake and it doesn't actually look like a fish. And for a human example, if I see Mackenzie in the hall and I go like this, she automatically does it back because it's a fixed action pattern. Okay, so we have imprinting, which is a type of behavior that includes both learning and innate components and is generally reversible. Um, every imprinting has a sensitive period, which is a limited phase in an animal's development that is the only time when certain behaviors can be learned. So when the young imprints on their parent, they do that so they can learn behaviors while the parent learns to recognize its own offspring. They don't automatically recognize each other. The young has no innate recognition of the mother. They respond to the first object they see that has certain characteristics. So here we have um, Conrad, Conrad Lorenz's famous experiment where he had um, ducks imprint on him. And they imprinted on him because they saw him as the first object that had certain key characteristics. And that's why the experiment worked. There are different directional movements, and the first one is kinesis, and this is a simple change in activity or turning rate in response to stimulus. So our example is sow bugs, and they exhibit response to variation in humidity. So in a dry open area, sow bugs move around a lot, but once they get to a moist site, like under a leaf or a log, then they stop moving around as much. And the stimulus would be how much humidity there is, and that determines how much movement they have. Another type is taxis, which is more or less automatic and oriented movement toward or away from a stimulus, and our example is trout who automatically stream upstream away from in the opposite direction of the current, which would be their stimulus. There's also migration, which is under genetic control, and is the seasonal movement of animals from one region to another. Um, for example, captive migratory black caps, um, if, when they're in a cage, they would spend their nights hopping restlessly or rapidly flapping their wings on their perch, trying to escape in order to migrate, because they have a certain time ingrained into them where they have to migrate. Signals and communication. Signal is a behavior that causes change in another animal's behavior. And communication is the transmission of, reception of, and response to signals. So animals communicate using visual, auditory, chemical, tactile, and electrical signals. And there's two types, chemical and auditory communication. Chemical communication is done through pheromones, um, which are chemical substances that emit odors. Um, they often relate to reproductive behavior, and they are most common amongst animal, mammals and insects. Um, the context of a chemical signal can be as important as the chemical itself. For example, honeybees. In the hive, the drones... Um, are, unaf are um, unaffected by the queen and then once so they can work without being um, without being distracted by the queen but once they're outside the hive they don't uh, they can be are free to mate however they want and for non-reproductive behavior for the minnow and catfish if one of those animals are hurt then they send out a pheromone that warns other animal uh, their other species um, others in their species that there is a danger in the area and those other um, in their species flee there's also auditory communication, which is through hearing. So like courtship songs of many insects, which are under genetic control and the songs of most bird species. There is also different mating and parental behavior. For this example, we have a vole and they are monogamous and the male is active in the raising of young, which is rare in mammals. And then the V1A receptors cause them to show the monogamous mating behaviors. Um, they can, there can be dietary influence on mate choice. Um, so, for example, female fruit flies avoid surf, some of female fruit flies avoid males of the species that have different diets. Um, so, fruit flies can use sense of taste in choosing a mate. And so, if the hydrocarbons are different than what they are used to or than what they want, then they don't mate with that fruit fly. Um, in an experiment done by Janet Bester Meredith and Catherine Marla, they um, tested aggressive behavior. 
And so they tested prairie voles in California mice, um, and both were monogamous and provide parental care, but the mice were more aggressive before mating. And so they placed the newborn California mice with a different species of mice that weren't monogamous and showed little parental care and also did the vice versa. And so the ones that weren't monogamous became more monogamous, the ones that were less monogamous became more monogamous when they um, placed them with a different species. Okay, there's six types of learning, and learning is the modification of behavior based on, sci on specific experiments. Okay, so the first type of learning, there's habituation, which is loss of responsiveness to a stimuli that conveys little or no information. So animals stop responding to a stimuli if they realize that there's no consequences to that stimuli. And this can increase fitness by allowing the nervous system to focus on stimuli that signal food, mates, or actual danger. For example, the cry-wolf effect. Say an, animal, say an animal signals to the rest of its group that there, is, there isn't, that there is danger around, but there really isn't, then the rest of the group will re react to help their fellow animal. But if this keeps happening and there's never any consequence to it, then the group will eventually learn and stop reacting to the stimulus. There's also spatial and cognitive maps. Spatial learning is the modification of behavior based on experience with spatial structure of the environment. And this includes location of nest sites, hazards, food, and prospective mates. There, a landmark is a, is a location indicator, and a cognitive map is the internal representation or code of the spatial relationship between objects and an animal surrounding. So, for example, if a bee is trying to get back to its nest and the nest is originally surrounded by pine cones, they will automatically go to the pine cones because they see those as a landmark to where their nest is. But if they're going by cognitive map, then they know where their nest is and they just automatically go there without the pine cones. Associative learning, there's two types. Um, it's the ability to associate one feature of the environment with another. There's classical and operant conditioning. Classical conditioning is it uses an arbitrary stimulus is associated with a reward or punishment. For example, there's an experiment done on fruit flies which taught them to avoid a certain order by associating it with an electric shock. And the famous experiment done by Ivan Pavlov and his dogs. He was trying to study digestion and he would bring them food and ring a bell at the same time to signal to his dogs that there was food and they would start salivating. Well eventually over time he kept doing this and they would start to salivate at the bell and not the food. So he realized that their, the stimulus was the bell and that their response was salivating. So that's why we have this meme here. Um, operant conditioning, it's trial and error learning. Animals associate learns to associate its own behaviors with reward or punishment. Um, for example, if a coyote goes to a porcupine and gets quills all stuck in its face, it knows never to do that again. It knows to avoid porcupines. Uh, a famous experiment, though, is B.F. Skinner. He's famous for training pigeons through his Skinner boxes, which is also operant conditioning. Uh, cognition and problem solving. Cognition is the ability of an animal's nervous system to perceive, store, process, and use information gathered by sensory receptors. This study of animal cognition is cognitive ethology. So this studies connection between an animal's nervous system and its behavior. It categorizes by same and different, and many animals learn to solve problems through observation. For example, if a chimpanzee is trying to learn how to craft oil palm nuts, they'll look to their, their, older, their older companions and chimpanzees in order to learn. Uh, genetic and environmental interaction. Um, this, there an example is with um, songs. Uh, the, there's a sensitive period for developing songs, and most birds are stimulated by the songs of their own species. Uh, after matching their own singing to the song it memorized, the song crystallizes as its final song. When there's no sensitive period, uh, it begins with a subsong, and the song becomes flexible, and new syllables can be added to the original. Uh, for example, the top bird, they do, the, they do this with a sensitive period. They listen, and they eventually come up with their own, and then they listen again and they crystallize their final song, while the bottom example, they have a sub-song and then they keep adding new syllables and the song is flexible because they can keep adding it in each year and there's never really a crystallized final song because of this. So for behavioral variation, there are different types of behaviors and for um, prey selection, individuals within a species can have different choices in food depending on their environment. So for example, garter snakes. In garter snakes that live in areas that do not have a lot of water, they don't eat slugs. But ones that live close to um, water, they eat certain types of slugs, so it just depends on where they live. And for aggressive behavior, that can be determined by the amount of predators in the area. So the more predators there are, the more timid the behavior. 
um, experimental evidence, um, a specific gene for foraging is found in Drosophila melanogaster, which is a type of fruit fly, and that and is made specifically to help the animal forage. And then there are black cap migratory patterns. Um, birds migrate in different directions based on their origination, west, southwest, or south. In caged birds, <coughs> they fly in the direction that they would have if they were free to migrate. And as you can see in the top picture, the bird is flying to the top left which and leaving scratch marks, which is the direction it would leave. And then in the bottom, you can see the map of the different places that the birds fly to. Okay, there's optimal foraging behavior. Um, foraging theory, sorry. And foraging behavior is a compromise between the benefits of nutrition and the cost of obtaining food. So there's energy cost and benefits. And for example, crows, they have to fly up and drop the whelk to crack it open and get the food on the inside. So they go to the point where it is most beneficial for them to drop it where it cracks the first time, but they don't spend a whole lot of energy flying out very high. And for the risk of predation, mule deer and mountain lions. Mountain lions live in the fringes, so the deer avoid the fringes and live mostly in the meadows in the middle and stay in the middle away from the fringes. There are different types of mating behavior. There are promiscuous, which is no strong pair bonds, monogamous, which only has one partner, polygamous, which has multiple partners, and in that there's polygyny, which is one male, multiple females, and then polyandry, which is one female, multiple males. Um, the needs of the young are an important factor in mating, and if the young are very demanding, often both parents are involved in caring. Um, and then often if there's a certain opportunity, if the male knows for certain that it's the father of the offspring, then that is more likely to help with the raising, but if it's very low, um, which is what it often is, that is why um, there is uh, less chance of it of the male helping. A mating choice, um, it's mostly by females, and the central role in, and it's the central role in evolution of male behavior and anatomy, and it causes the males to be more colorful or flamboyant than females. And there's a lot of male competition because of this. Um, there's agonistic behavior, which is ritualized contest that determines which competitor gains more access to a resource. Um, in some species, more than one mating behavior can be successful. Um, for example, there are cuttlefish, and in the big cuttlefish, they're colorful and they like to, and they will fight over a female and they'll be very aggressive. But while they're fighting, sometimes the smaller male will sneak in behind the big males while they're fighting and mate with the female while the two males are fighting. So there's like a, so the female will accept either one. Um, game theory. It was developed by John Nash and it evaluates alternative strategies and situations where the outcome depends on each individual strategy and on the strategies of other individuals. So a way of thinking about evolution in situations where the fitness of a certain phenotype is influenced by others in the population. Um, it also explains how in some species the fitness of different types of males are unequal. And for example, we have the example of the side blotched lizard. So we have these three different colors of lizard. We have the, the red, the blue, and the green. The red ones are very aggressive and have larger areas of land. And that means that the yellow, which are kind of sly, they can sneak in and mate with the females while they're there. But the blue has no chance because they're less aggressive. But then the yellow ends up beating out the red, but then the blue beats out the yellow, and then the yellow beats out the red. And it's just a constant cycle. So there's altruism and inclusive fitness. Altruism is selflessness, essentially. Some animals do sometimes act in a way that reduce their personal fitness but increase others in their own population. Um, for example, squirrels and bees and naked mole rats. Um, inclusive fitness is total effect on an individual has on proliferating its genes by producing its own offspring and by providing A that enables its close relatives to produce offspring. Hamilton's rule. Um, okay, so altruism is a favorable, is a favor, is favored variables. Um, there's a recipient benefit, which is B, and the cost to the altruist, which is C. The coefficient of relatedness is R, and A equals the probability that if two individuals share a common parent slash ancestor, a particular gene present in one individual will also be present in the second. So Hamilton's rule is R, B is greater than C. It's when natural selection favors altruism, and when the benefit to the recipient mul multiplied by the coefficient overseeds the cost to the altruist. All right, there's kin selection, and kin selection is an altruistic behavior between related individuals, and it weakens with hereditary distance. So as you can see here, the females tend to stay closer to home and are more altruistic because they uh, help out more with the type of species that they are in, but the males uh, go away and they don't help very much. Reciprocal altruism is when an animal helps another that is not a relation, and then the aided individual returns a favor in the future, and this is done because the animal expects that return. Um, and then there's social learning, which is um, learning about the type, different types of culture, and then there's mate copying, which individuals in a population copy the mate choices of others, and that can lead to certain um, uh, genes being more prominent because of um, a certain individual influences the rest of the population. And then there's uh, sociobiology, which is um, a certain behavioral characteristic that exists because there are expressions of genes that have been perpetuated by natural selection. And thank you.
for listening. <laughs>